The Soviet Union was not an evil empire created by capitalist propaganda. Like everything else, it contained both good and bad. Its failure and disappearance from history does not make it entirely bad, nor does the fact that it contributed positively to humanity make it entirely good. However, we do know that as the Communist Party failed, the country became more closed and the pressure on its citizens increased. Nevertheless, the socialist governance model was an important experiment for humanity. The goal of reaching communism played an important role in balancing the capitalist system and in gaining or protecting social rights until the collapse of the Soviet Union. Although more than 30 years have passed since its collapse, there are still people in Russia, Azerbaijan, or any former Soviet country who long for those days and claim that life was better during the Soviet era than it is now. For example, the Levada Center, which conducts public opinion research in Russia, regularly asks people if they regret the collapse of the Soviet Union. When they last asked this question in 2018, 66% of Russians, or almost two out of every three Russians, answered yes. So what was it really like to live in the Soviet Union? Let's take a closer look at its pros and cons. Let's first look at the positives of living in the Soviet Union. One of the most well-known and first things talked about in relation to living in the Soviet Union is that all citizens were guaranteed a sense of security in life. This sense of security was based on fundamentals such as housing, education, food, and healthcare. Regardless of their education or skill level, citizens were guaranteed jobs, and they didn't have to worry about concerns such as losing their job tomorrow or how they would pay their expenses if they lost their job. Begging on the streets was never seen. The government provided housing for everyone's needs. For example, if a single person, a couple, or a family didn't have a home, they were first placed in communal apartments known as communalco, where every room was occupied by a different family and the bathroom and kitchen were shared. People lived in these communal apartments until the new buildings were ready. When the new buildings were ready, the people who were next in line were given the opportunity to live in their own apartments. They only paid a usage fee, which was essentially a form of rent paid to the government. This fee also included electricity, water, and gas consumption, and it was calculated so that it wouldn't exceed 2% of people's monthly income. Since everyone was guaranteed a job, they didn't have any worries about losing their home or job. In fact, there were even free vacation opportunities for people. Soviet citizens would take advantage of state-provided free sanatoriums, rest houses, or camps during their annual holidays. These facilities were available on the Black Sea coast, especially in Sochi and Crimea, for a beach holiday, and in the inland areas for winter or spa holidays. One of the most praised aspects of the Soviet Union was its education system. Prior to the establishment of the Soviet Union, there was a serious problem of ignorance in the population of the region it encompassed. Education was never prioritized during the period of Tsarist Russia and the Russian Empire, and there was already poverty that was even more dire than the lack of education before the Bolshevik Revolution. From the moment the Soviet Union was established, it took incredible strides in education and was able to solve the problem of ignorance in a short time. The first generation of Soviet citizens' parents were almost entirely illiterate, but this generation managed to receive a high level of education. The quality of their education was proven with the 13 Nobel Prizes they received in the scientific field. Soviet students also won many awards in international knowledge and skill competitions they participated in. All this education was provided free of charge. They did not limit people's cultural development to just schools. Operas, symphonies, theaters, and concerts were free for all citizens. Even many of the most remote Soviet citizens had received music education. Quality and widespread education also led to the emergence of a quality healthcare workforce without personnel shortages and ensured that the free healthcare services provided were efficient, high quality, and easily accessible to everyone. Soviet citizens did not know what it was like to wait in long lines at hospitals, wait for months to get an appointment, or wait for days for tests and lab results. The process moved quickly from the moment they entered the hospital. It is almost unknown that the ambulance system in the Soviet Union was one of the best ambulance systems in the world at that time. For example, in the United States at the same time, there were no doctors and ambulances. There was only an emergency response team, and when the patient or injured person was brought to the hospital, they were examined by a doctor. In the Soviet Union, there was always a doctor on duty in every ambulance. Sometimes, depending on the severity of the case, a specialist doctor would also go to the ambulance to provide medical assistance to the patient or injured person. 
After the 1950s, many chemical food additives, especially margarine, began to be widely used all over the world. Along with this period, the obesity disease also began to increase significantly. In fact, after World War II, the world population was rapidly increasing. For example, the world population, which was approximately 2.5 billion in 1950, had climbed to 3.7 billion by 1970. The human population has never increased so rapidly in history. Natural products were insufficient to feed this population. Food safety had disappeared in many places. The Soviet Union was one of the first countries to implement food safety policy as a state policy in modern times. The use of artificial food colors, preservatives, and sweeteners was prohibited. Instead, natural products obtained from tomatoes, beets, pumpkins, and flour extracts were used. There was also margarine in the Soviet Union, but they knew how destructive palm oil used in this product was on the human body. In 1978, they published a food codex for margarine. They limited the palm oil ratio in margarine to a maximum of 10%. At the same time, in Western countries, margarines contained much more palm oil. If we exclude a small minority of high-ranking officials from the Communist Party, all citizens in the Soviet Union were truly equal. Valuing money and wealth was not encouraged, and everyone benefited equally from all available services and goods. Regardless of their profession, there was very little difference in salaries among individuals. Being educated was highly regarded, and titles such as doctor and associate professor were admired by society, while being a professor was seen as a noble position. In schools, the children of high-ranking officials and the children of the lowest-level citizens received the same education sitting in the same row. Now let's take a look at the negative aspects of the Soviet Union. I mentioned at the beginning that people were safe in this country thanks to the government's protective approach, but at the same time, the government planned all aspects of their lives from a single center, regardless of their personal wishes and talents. We are talking about the world's largest country. For example, someone born and raised in St. Petersburg in the West could be sent to Sakhalin Oblast thousands of kilometers away, where there is an approximately eight-hour time difference between their birthplace, where their family and friends still live. Note that this eight-hour time difference is not stated as a distance. When it is 8 p.m. in Sakhalin, it is noon in St. Petersburg. Additionally, people could be sent to challenging regions such as Siberia and the Arctic region against their wishes. Breaking away from the life planned for citizens by the state was considered a crime. If people refused to work in the job offered by the state and the period of their inactivity exceeded four months, it would be classified as social parasitism, a crime. The state had a paranoid feeling towards its citizens, and this paranoia increased with each passing day towards the downfall. The aim was for all citizens to be uniform. Having a different opinion and expressing it could lead to great trouble for that person. Moreover, apart from political views, if an individual had a different appearance or lifestyle from the general society, it could even lead to raids on their homes and investigations. Traveling to foreign countries was unofficially prohibited. In order for people to be able to leave the country, they needed to have a passport, and the Communist Party only gave passports to a very small minority. Even athletes, artists, scientists, or high-level government officials could go through strict investigations when they wanted to travel abroad. In order to advance in their positions, regardless of their talent and performance, people had to join the Communist Party. It was not enough to be a member of the Communist Party on paper. People had to attend meetings, prepare speeches praising communism, and participate in rallies and other events. If they did not do these things, they would not have a chance to be promoted. Even scientists and academics had to be members of the Communist Party in order to advance and be appointed department heads. Many incompetent and ignorant people had advanced and surpassed others simply because they were Communist Party members. This was one of the biggest problems at the root of the entire system's breakdown. The Soviet Union did not face a shortage of personnel in their healthcare system, but they experienced a major problem in drug production. While they were always at the forefront of mechanical technology, they lagged behind in other scientific and technological fields because they needed to interact with the rest of the world to make progress, but the Communist Party did not provide their scientists with this opportunity. As a result, they fell far behind Western countries in drug production. It was not possible to find even simple over-the-counter medications in the Soviet Union that could be obtained anywhere else in the world. In the 1980s, the drug shortage reached its peak. Those who had the chance to go abroad were smuggling drugs into the country for their families, relatives, and acquaintances. 
Some even began to use this as a way to make money, leading to the emergence of a black market for drugs. Food safety was certainly a good thing, but due to inefficient production, queues began to form in front of markets and shortages began to emerge in the 1980s. People were searching for products they could buy on empty shelves in the markets. Having access to products that people in other countries could easily obtain was like a dream for Soviet citizens. People waited in line stretching hundreds of meters just for a can of food or half a kilo of fruit. One of the biggest factors contributing to the collapse of the Soviet Union was its planned economy. While having an economy planned out in advance can be a good thing for stability, in this planned economy, all production was managed by decisions made from a single center. Every official in the hierarchy played with numbers on paper in order to please their superiors, or they reduced the quality of the produced goods in order to produce more with the same amount of raw materials. The quality of goods decreased as more were produced, and the numbers were inflated on paper so that the amount of goods produced never matched the demand. For example, the Mostrich brand of cars that the Soviets were identified with was quite successful and well-built in the 1970s. In 1970, the car placed third in the rally race they participated in. The Mostrich factory had a production capacity of 60,000 cars per year. When the car gained international attention after the 1970 rally, the Communist Party ordered the factory to increase production capacity. However, to do so, the factory needed more raw materials, machinery, and equipment, as well as more workers. The factory only received more workers, and even then, many of them lacked the necessary training to do their jobs. The central government demanded and expected more, so the factory managed to increase production from 60,000 to 100,000 cars, but due to a lack of raw materials, machinery, and equipment, and the fact that untrained workers were put on the job, the quality of Moskvich cars sharply declined. And of course, the infamous censorship. In fact, if it weren't for the Swedes noticing the Chernobyl explosion, which was one of the world's biggest nuclear disasters, they would have applied a great deal of censorship even on that matter. Many films and books were banned from publication because they were thought to be against communist ideology. Some films and books were also published with certain parts removed. The same was true for theater plays. It was impossible to report on any news that was not wanted by the Communist Party in the media. Even foreign authors known to be communist were subject to immediate book recalls if they criticized the Soviet government in any way. Human psychology tends to easily forget the negative details of past events after a certain amount of time has passed, while still remembering the positive ones. During the final years of the Soviet Union and in the aftermath of its collapse, it was fashionable to express contemptuous views about the country. But as I said before, every country and every form of government has both good and bad aspects. In a 2018 survey, 66% of Russians expressed regret about the collapse of the Soviet Union, which was the highest percentage up until that time. 